Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. So first up today, we had a brand new video on Idra Group's YouTube channel, but as I was recording, they apparently took it down. As you can see in the title though, it said what's next after showing us that the 9,000 ton Gigapress has been assembled and tested. Now my answer to this question would be, well, hopefully shipping to Giga Austin so they can assemble it and begin testing it there for use with the Cybertruck. So I'm not sure what this is about, but I hope that the testing is indeed complete because the process to ship it to Giga Austin and then reassemble it there may take around six months. So we need that to happen relatively soon. Next up, there's a lot of confusion around this reporting from not a Tesla app, but I know where the source is coming from. So I just wanna show you the full clip from AI Day so we can all understand what's really going on, but a little bit of context first. Regular summon would be, let's say you're standing in the lobby of a cheesecake factory and your Tesla is way across the lot and it's pouring out. So standing in the lobby, you summon your car to you. Reverse summon is of course the opposite. You drive up as close to the cheesecake lobby as you can, get out, run inside, and then send your car to go park by itself. That would be reverse summon. Also, when Elon and Tesla refer to these software stacks, just think of them as different code bases that control how the car will behave in different environments. So there's been a code stack for the parking lot, there's been a code stack for the highway, which sometimes they refer to as the production version of autopilot that's still in use for the highway. Then we have a code base for city driving, that's the FSD beta. And the goal all along has been to merge all of those code bases into one single stack. So here it is from AI Day where all of this reporting is coming from. I just want you guys to hear it directly from the source. Uh, and there's quite a big improvement that we're expecting to release next month. Uh, that will be especially good at uh, uh, assessing the velocity of, of fast moving cross traffic and, and a bunch of other things. So, anyone want to elaborate? Yeah, I guess so. There used to be a lot of differences between production autopilot and the full self-driving beta, but those differences have been getting smaller and smaller over time. Um, I think just a few months ago, we now use the same vision-only object detection stack in both FSD and in the production autopilot on all vehicles. Um, there's still a few differences, the primary one being the way that we predict lanes right now. Um, so we upgraded the modeling of lanes so that it could handle these more complex geometries like I mentioned in the talk. Um, in production autopilot, we still use a simpler lane model, but we're extending our current FSD beta models to work in all sort of highway scenarios as well. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the, the version of uh, FSD beta that I drive actually does have the integrated stack. So just, uh, it, it uses the FSD stack uh, both in city streets and highway, and uh, it works quite well for me. Uh, but, we, but we need to validate it in all kinds of weather, like heavy rain, snow, dust, and just make sure it's working uh, as, uh, better than the production stack uh, in, in across a wide range of uh, in, environments. Uh, but it we're pretty close to that. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, I don't know, maybe... It'll definitely be before the end of the year, and, and may, maybe November. Yeah, in our personal drives, uh, the FSD stack on highway drives already way better than the production stack we have. And we do expect to also include the parking lot stack as a part of the FSC stack before the end of this year. So that will basically bring us to you sit in the car in the parking lot and drive till the end of the parking lot at a parking spot before the end of this year. So by the end of this year, the parking lot code should be integrated with the FSD beta, meaning FSD beta will now handle parking lots much better. It's not really clear how reverse summon and smart summon fit into all of this, but it's assumed that that's part of the parking lot stack. In conclusion, I do think some level of optimism that these features are available by the end of this year and are actually useful is warranted. However, if I'm being honest, after watching a lot of summon videos, I'm definitely still skeptical. Sticking with autopilot and FSD, Robert Scoble shared this video of debris avoidance. He said he went back to this location four different times and it did it perfectly every time, even with oncoming traffic. So definitely good to see things like this. Hopefully you can see the debris in the road right there and avoiding it nicely. Next up, you may recall, I think it may have been last week when Elon tweeted this picture of Hawaii saying that it was the same time when the last coal shipment arrived that a new shipment of Megapacks had arrived. I just wanna highlight the scale of what Hawaii is really set to do here over the next two years or so. This is from hawaiianelectric.com. It says nine renewable energy projects are scheduled to come online on Oahu through 2024, 
Most of them are set to come online in the first half of 2023, including the Kapolei Energy Storage Project, the one that Elon tweeted the picture of. So if you go to the Hawaiian Electric Dashboard where you can actually track all of these different battery energy storage projects, this list is approved by regulators. I went through and added all of these up in terms of megawatt hours. The total was 2,250 megawatt hours or 2.25 gigawatt hours all set to come online within the next two years. And looking at most top five lists of the biggest battery energy storage projects globally, they'll have numbers between 1600 megawatt hours like you have in Moss Landing, down to you know 500 megawatt hours being in the top five. So clearly with Hawaii over 2000 megawatt hours, granted they're on different islands, they're deploying some serious battery storage. On a similar note, if we look at the most recent data from Last Bulb that's been tracking the VPP program using Tesla Powerwalls in California, you can see as of October 5th, it's crossed 5,000 homes in this program. Checking out the summary data, around 577 megawatt hours have been contributed during grid events so far, around 15 kilowatt hours, the average contribution per home per event, meaning an average of 76 megawatt hours of potential backup energy per event. For context, if this VPP program is providing around 76 megawatt hours per event, that's 76,000 kilowatt hours. If we look at historical data, the average home in the United States uses about 30 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. So 76,000 divided by 30 is about 2,500 homes on average that could be powered just from the extra energy being made available by this VPP program Per event. Shifting gears to Giga Berlin, RBB now reporting that Tesla is the largest private employer in Brandenburg. Currently, there's around 7,000 people from over 50 nations currently working at Giga Berlin. That's around 3,000 more than they had in May of this year. And they're still trying to hire to enable that third shift of production, which may not come until quarter one of next year. Next up, I wanna take a quick peek into the Australian market. This isn't just for one month, but for the first three quarters of the year. Year to date in Australia, Tesla has sold 8,600 Model 3s, which puts it above the previously best-selling vehicle year after year, the Toyota Camry, which currently sits around 8,000 sales through the first three quarters. And as we would expect, the Model Y is coming in hot. It was just made available in one of the first full months it was on sale, sold 4,300 in the month of September. And given that on average over the last decade, Australia has seen around 1 million new car sales every year. If Tesla can reach a 20% market share in this market in the future, that's enough for about 200,000 sales per year. Next up, Marco, the Tesla supercharger detective is pretty fired up today as he seems to have found a leak of all upcoming addresses for supercharger locations. I did go to the link and here it is. I'll include it below. You can command F your location to see what may be coming soon on this list. Some of these have been on the map previously, but if you wanna take a look at the list, it's below. Next, we have a press release today from Volvo Trucks saying they're set to deliver 20 fully electric heavy duty semi to Amazon in Germany by the end of this year, saying they're gonna travel 1 million road kilometers every year or about 620,000 miles. Now, Volvo has around six different semi trucks that it's been developing, but this deal specifically is for the Volvo FH. Now, this truck is said to be able to operate at a total weight of 44 tons or around 97,000 pounds. These Volvo FH trucks are set to have a battery capacity of 540 kilowatt hours, giving a range of up to 300 kilometers or 186 miles, but they say this electric truck can cover up to 500 kilometers or 310 miles during a normal workday if a top-up charge is added. Series production of these Volvo FH trucks have just started production September of this year. It looks like the FH truck will have different battery capacities available though, ranging from 180 up to 540 kilowatt hours. And as far as I could find so far on the internet, it looks like the DC fast charging still only has rates of up to 250 kilowatts. Next up, in case you didn't already see this on Tesla Daily last night, Ford has increased the pricing of the F-150 Lightning yet again, this time another $5,000, so now, 
The base model starts at just under $52,000. Nothing will change though for existing reservation holders. Next up, we get a little bit of information on the upcoming Honda Prologue. This is set to debut in 2024, so still some time away, but it's going to share the same powertrain as the Chevy Blazer, just with a different exterior styling. The Prologue should have two screens, an 11 inch digital gauge cluster and an 11.3 inch central infotainment touchscreen. Again, nothing is for sure this far out, but people are saying range figures should be between 250 and 320 miles. So this is set to be Honda's first electric SUV. What do you guys think? Here we have Toyota now saying they found a solution to the wheels flying off of its electric BZ4X and they're going to restart production. In some not so great news though, Tesla added that it had identified and fixed a potential problem with airbags in the car. Some airbags had been improperly installed at the factory and were at risk to fail or cause injury because of the placement of a strap inside the airbag assembly. Toyota had not previously disclosed that problem. Also important to note, Toyota has not yet said when United States sales of this vehicle will resume. Next up, just real quick, Faraday future is still a mess. It looks like the executive chair has left over death threats from some of the investors. Investors have been trying to gain more control of the company. Production of the vehicles have been delayed. They said they need more money. Its auditor left the company. Now the SEC is probing to look at its financials. Basically just a complete nightmare of an organization as far as we can tell. And finally, as I was recording, Sawyer broke the news. The S&P officially upgraded Tesla stock to investment grade for the first time ever. Now BBB up two notches previously from BB+. So the blue column is the S&P, Tesla going from BB+, previously, jumping up one, two, to BBB. And here are some highlights from the release. The S&P is predicting over 100 EV models in North America by 2026, over four times as many compared to this year. They said over the next three to five years, a few of these could become formidable competitors to Tesla due to vertical integration and leveraging existing customer bases. Tesla's strong liquidity adds a cushion to the BBB rating paired with a solid cash flow at least through 2023. These levels are well above our established threshold of auto cash balances of roughly 15% of sales. With more cash on its balance sheet than debt, Tesla appears easily able to fund its global expansion. Once Tesla's growth rate slows with more competition, we believe its financial policy and balance sheet flexibility will face the harsh test of industry cyclicality pressures in the auto industry. The S&P could lower its ratings if Tesla adopts greater shareholder distributions or acquisitions that cause its financial cushion to reduce materially, or it can't sustain its solid free operating cash flow due to slower growth. The S&P could raise its ratings if Tesla sustains a first mover advantage and EV demand intensifies, or it sustains its track record of free cash flow beyond 2024, or it remains committed to a prudent financial policy. And lastly, environmental concerns are a positive consideration in our credit rating analysis. Tesla has an advantage over competitors given its battery and powertrain tech, the superior range per kilowatt hour compared to competitors, and a lack of ICE vehicles, which are under increasing scrutiny. So now this is Dylan talking, not the S&P. What does this mean? As we've said before, this will open up a new pool of investors that are able to buy Tesla stock, think pension funds and hedge funds that are limited to buying only companies rated investment grade or better. This will happen over months though, not something that's gonna happen in the next few hours. Now we just wait for Moody's to follow suit, but this has been expected now and shout out to Alexandra, our lovely Tesla boomer mama, for all of her hard work in educating everyone about this and applying the full court press to the S&P. Well done, sister. That'll do it for today. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.